It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it, it's an interesting task going over th after three great speakers, so my goal is to not repeat what they said. Um, enabling learning health systems through cognitive computing um, is an interesting topic for me because within Watson, um, our goal, our mission, is to enhance and scale human expertise. So it's, a, it's really another way of um, learning health systems when you think about it. Now, there's, there's, there's three uh, uh, fundamental critical success factors from our perspective in enabling a learning health system. The first one is gathering all of the appropriate information. The second one is enabling a systemic outcomes-driven learning system. And then the third critical success factor is making it available for all stakeholders. Now, I, I respect this is a big data conference in healthcare, so I have to believe you've, you've heard statistics or came in knowing statistics prior. Uh, I'll, sh I'll share some additional ones to provide context in how we think about this. Um, we, we come at it from two angles, knowledge-driven models and data-driven models. Starting on the left side of the chart with knowledge-driven models, Think of things like medical literature doubling, I, I hear the numbers changing all the time, every couple of years, uh, moving towards days by 2020. Um, think of 180,000 clinical trials to the last point. Think of 700,000 research articles published each year. It is, there's no question that in many, many lifetimes nobody could read that much information. You look on the right side of the chart, and it gets even more daunting with data-driven related insights. So um, the graphic on the right side is something that was developed by IBM Research as part of a global technology outlook. And the, the statistics are per lifetime, so data generated for one life. Um, starting at the bottom is where most people are focused, which is clinical data, approximately 400 gigabytes per life. You go up the stack, and then the next area is genomics, about six terabytes. And then where it really becomes overwhelming is when you get into the exogenous data, the behavioral, the social, um, and the statistic is 1,100 terabytes. Now, interestingly enough, there's also been many studies that say it's in that exogenous data where 70% of the determinants of health exist. So it, it gives you a sense for if we're going to gather information and optimize decisions, just how big this pool is. The second thing I mentioned was enabling an outcomes-driven uh, learning system through um, a pretty straightforward design pattern from our perspective. Um, it, it's really about understanding the individual, ensuring that evidence-based insights are applied, and then learning from that process and, and, and course correcting. Now, underneath this, though, is some incredibly sophisticated capabilities that are required. Um, you can see from some of the images, it's, it's, it's all sorts of unstructured data sources. It can be things like language. It can be things like understanding what's, what's underneath language, like psychographically analyzing somebody, understanding the sentiment that's in their language. It can be things like uh, uh, raw feature extraction on images. And, 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 and then it's things like personal choices. And, and so what are the preferences of the patient and ensuring that the decision-making process incorporates that. Evidence-based insights, how do you marry that world of data-driven and knowledge-driven together? What does literature say I should do for a patient with exactly these circumstances? What do best practices from Stanford or pick your favorite institution say I should do for a patient like this? And then marry that together with data-driven, right? The patients like me type scenario. Tell me from the 1,100 terabytes times however many patients in the repository of you know, what is the optimal answer to a question within the context of that patient, right? And, and bringing that together. So you have a combination of what does Stanford think is best practice, but then you can marry it with what works well for my system. 
maybe we're not as good as, at surgery, right? And, and as you think about enabling these learning systems around the world, and you have such variants, uh, variations, excuse me, in, in capabilities and things like that, it, it, it becomes a very real challenge. And when you think about, I started on the patient intake process mentioning, well, it'd be good to know what their preferences are. That pretty much determines what a good outcome is. Because what's a good outcome for, for me may not be a good outcome for you. So how do you track that in a way that's systemic and then have the machine learn from that process? Third thing I mentioned was enabling this capability across all stakeholders. So we are in the very early days of Watson, but we already have many solutions that are being applied in, in, in the health ecosystem today. And so I'll share with you my frame of reference. We by no means think we're the, the, the beginning and end of, of, of uh, uh, insights, um, but we, we, we think we're doing some interesting things uh, uh, across this continuum. So I roughly break it down across uh, three value categories which align against the stakeholders. Improving engagement, whether it be a patient, a consumer, a citizen, pick your favorite vernacular. Um, optimizing research and development. And um, improving clinical outcomes. So improving engagement, we have a solution aptly named Engagement Advisor, which is essentially a consumer-driven solution. For those of you that watched the Jeopardy demonstration a few years ago, this is what most of you imagine Watson is. You ask a, a, a difficult question, um, and you get a very good answer. But imagine something that's developed now over the past three years. So we've built in dialogue capability so that you can actually make it a conversation versus a, a discrete question and answer type exchange. We have, we have solutions that we've developed in wellness, uh, chronic conditions, things like that. Um, and, and since it does have a dialogue ability, it, it, it provides almost a, like a, a self-service nudging ability with the individual you're interacting with. Within research and development, we have a, a, a few solutions um, that, that we developed. Uh, the first solution is related to discovery. We have a solution where we ingested Watson with 40 million research documents, and we've trained it on certain domains. Um, one of the things we published with Baylor College of Medicine last year was some work we did on the P53 protein. They were interested in phosphorylation, um, and the run rate for the industry is, is about one per year for new targets. Um, within weeks of using Watson, they identified seven new targets. And basically, what they did is they let Watson do the heavy lifting of reading all of those 40 million documents. By the way, 70,000 of them are related to the P53 protein. And they said, Watson, help me understand um, you know, what, is, what are the types of things that will help me identify the new needles in the haystack. Um, genomics is a solution that we just announced uh, about two weeks ago. We're working with 14 organizations. In, in, in beta testing it, basically imagine those 40 million research documents along with pr proven sources such as the National Cancer Institute uh, Protein Interaction Database are integrated together and applied against DNA variation files and Watson can help in creating a biochemical picture of a tumor within minutes. Again, it's, it, it's leaving the, the reading um, and some of that heavy lifting to the machine um, and letting the clinicians and researchers focus on what do you do with those insights. Um, clinical trial matching was, was mentioned a couple of times. Uh, we trained a solution on the National Institute for Health Clinical Trials.gov. Imagine Watson reads 180,000 trials so that at the point of care, Watson can read the patient case and then tell you which trials the patient is eligible for. And again, you think about that statistic of 3% of people being considered for trials, it's, it, it's, it's something that the societal benefits here are profound. Already uh, shifting into the right side of the chart, which is improving clinical outcomes, and we have several solutions that we're, we're working on here. Um, uh, the first one gets into treatment advisors. So we have actually a couple of solutions we developed related to oncology. Um, one with Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, focused on lung breast colorectal cancer. Imagine you, you, you train a machine on millions of pages of medical literature and then have it ingest thousands of patient cases so that it gets an appreciation for how best to treat patients 
with those diseases. Similarly, we created a, a, a leukemia-based solution and a molecular targeted therapy solution with MD Anderson, and we're working with other organizations on other, other diseases with that same underlying capability. Um, the Electronic Medical Record Advisor is something we originally developed with the Cleveland Clinic. It's now being piloted at the Mayo Clinic, uh, and it's also part of a demonstration project with the Veterans Health Administration, where basically we have the machine read in the longitudinal history of the patient, both the structured fields and, more importantly, the unstructured fields, the nurse's notes, the doctor's notes, things like that. And imagine Watson can actually understand what is going on with the patient based upon looking at the continuity of care document. And it can do things like generate the problem list automatically. And actually in side-by-side -side comparisons against what the clinicians documented themselves versus what Watson determined, Watson actually scored higher. Because we know these people don't have enough time to you know, document things, right? They're focused on other activities all day long. And then the final one I'd, I'd highlight um, is a clinical reasoning solution, um, where basically uh, the initial use case was medical education, but what we did is we created a solution where Watson can reason through uh, certain questions, and we started with U.S. medical licensing exam questions, and Watson performed something known as inference chaining, where basically, based upon the problem being presented, it will... Um, uh, perform a series of inferences and then chain them together and essentially come up then with the best uh, answer to the question being asked. Now, the, 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 this use case was in initially developed with the Lerner College of Medicine and it wasn't a function of did Watson get it right with the patients. What they asked for Watson to do was visualize the way it was thinking. Every possible thing that Watson was thinking about a patient create a flow which outlines that thought process. And what they did with the students is they basically um, used it as a tool for problem-based learning to think broadly about the patient cases. So what I wanted to do today was kind of share with you my perspective on the three critical success factors related to a learning-based health system and some of the types of things that we're working on within Watson, and I appreciate your time. Thank you.